<clears throat> All right, um, this is our first lesson for classical reasoning. Uh, classical reasoning, as crazy as this might sound, is not a part of the high school curriculum. So you can get a high school diploma in America in the 21st century and never ever study a single sentence of the art of reasoning. But in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, uh, we study the art of reasoning. And this is one of those studies that we have to add to our studies, which is why we can't mess around and waste time with modern high school studies. We have lots of other studies to work on to get a good uh, classical Catholic education. And the most important study that there is, the most important classical study there is, I should say, the most important classical study is the art of reasoning. If you don't learn the art of reasoning, you can't study rhetoric. And if you don't learn the art of reasoning, you can never understand philosophy. The art of reasoning is the most important of all of the classical liberal arts. So what we should do in this first class is um, have an introduction to uh, the study of reasoning and, uh, and then get through this first chapter uh, I'll explain what book we're studying here and why we're studying it, but let's quickly start with a, uh, a, an overview. We've talked a number of times about the study of philosophy, that philosophy is the love or the pursuit of wisdom. <clears throat> and when we seek wisdom, we seek to know order. That's what it means to be wise. To be wise means to know the order in things to know the causes of things, to know the elements of things, the principles of things, to have true knowledge, true scientific knowledge of the different subjects of philosophy. The first division of philosophy is rational philosophy. We've talked about this a number of times. Rational philosophy, moral philosophy, and thirdly, natural philosophy. In this course, classical reasoning, we study rational philosophy. We seek to know the order of our thoughts, of our ideas. We seek to know what the right ordering of our thoughts is, and we seek to actually order our thoughts Rightly. We seek to know the science and practice it. So in classical reasoning, which is a series of courses, we're going to study rational philosophy. We'll take a look at what this is, okay? So rational philosophy. Now, throughout the ancient world, philosophers tried to study philosophy. They tried, but they couldn't because... They didn't have enough understanding of the art of reasoning to really do so. It was Aristotle, <clears throat> just like the other philosophical sciences, it was Aristotle who established the art of reasoning, as we're going to study, and he did so in a series of books. He published a series of books and the title of the whole series, and I want to make sure you get this, the title of the whole series is Oops, not Organos. The Organon. <clears throat> the Organon is the title of a series of books that Aristotle wrote which teach the whole art of reasoning. Okay, so when we talk about this first part of philosophy, rational philosophy, and we ask where should we go to study rational philosophy, the answer is Aristotle's Organon. Okay, and it's a series of books that are to be studied. The first book that Aristotle wrote 
in the organon is titled the categories. And I would like you to take this down in your notes. I would like you to memorize this. This is really important. The first book in the organon is titled the categories. And I'll explain a little bit about each book in a minute. The first book is the categories. The second book of the organon is titled On Interpretation. On Interpretation. The third book is titled Prior Analytics, or we could say Analytics 1, or First Analytics. But the title is usually written Prior Analytics. The fourth book is titled Posterior Analytics. The fifth book is titled The Topics. And the last book, the sixth book of the Organon, is titled Sophistical Refutations, and I'll explain what these mean. <clears throat> these six books make up what is called Aristotle's Organon, and that's where we learn classical reasoning. Categories on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and sophistical refutations. Some fancy words, but it's a very simple, very simple concept, very simple system. Very difficult to study, but very simple to understand the system itself and what it contains. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, all of this relates to what we studied in grammar especially what we studied in the first lesson, or the second lesson of Latin grammar. In Latin grammar, we learned that letters make syllables and syllables make words, right? <clears throat> in the categories, we study simple ideas and talk about words that represent simple ideas. <clears throat> so in the categories, Aristotle discusses simple ideas. The goal is to understand the right order of thoughts. And in the first book, we talk about the simplest kind of thoughts, simple, disconnected ideas, words. In the second, book on interpretation. We study sentences, or what are called in logic, propositions. <clears throat> so just like in grammar, we start with simple words, and then we move on to joining words together to form sentences in logic. The sentences that we use are called propositions. <clears throat> and then in prior analytics, we combine propositions to form arguments. In prior analytics, we study arguments. So if you ever wonder, where could I go to study to learn how to make arguments? The answer is prior analytics. That book explains it. <clears throat> now, when we talk about arguments, there are two different kinds of arguments, two different kinds of reasoning. One kind of reasoning, and I'm running out of board space here, one kind of reasoning is called demonstrative, demonstrative reasoning. 
And the other kind of reasoning, the other kind of arguments is called dialectical. Dialectical reasoning. Two different kinds of arguments. So arguments in general are introduced in prior analytics. A certain kind of argument, demonstrative arguments, are introduced in posterior analytics. And a different kind of arguments, called dialectical arguments, are introduced in topics. <clears throat> I don't expect that you know what all of that stuff means, but I'll explain it. And then in the last book, the title of the book is Sophistical Refutations. And you have to know what a sophist is before you can understand what sophistical refutations are. A sophist is a person who is a deceiver. It's a person who uses false arguments to trick people. It's what the devil does. St. Ignatius of Loyola said that the devil is a sophist. Sophists are people who deceive other people, and they do so for money. Sophists are not wise people. They're not sincere. They're not really interested in wisdom. They're not philosophers. Sophists are people who simply work to appear to be wise to appear to be wise for money. Sophists are fake philosophers. They are not interested in wisdom. They're not interested in virtue. They're not interested in any, in any of the benefits that come through real philosophy. They are simply interested in appearing to be wise men for the sake of money or pleasure, some kind of worldly benefit they seek by appearing to be wise. They're fake philosophers, false teachers, fake philosophers, sophists. <clears throat> and what they do is they deceive simple people. They deceive people who aren't able to understand what they're doing. They deceive simple people. <clears throat> Sophists were Aristotle's enemies. Aristotle worked to defeat Sophists. He wanted to expose and reveal the Sophists. He wanted to show who the fake philosophers were. And he wanted to show that their arguments were actually false. They were fake arguments. They appeared to be reasonable arguments. They appear to be reasonable, but they're not. And he worked to teach how you can find what's false in the arguments of sophists. And he explains this in his book, Sophistical Refutations. Refutations means to defeat someone's arguments. Okay? A refutation is to defeat someone's arguments, to, to respond to, to destroy someone's argument. In this book, Aristotle explains how to refute or destroy the false arguments of the sophists. Okay? So posterior analytics teaches us about demonstrative arguments. Topics teaches us about dialectical arguments. Sophistical refutations teaches us about what Aristotle called apparent, apparent arguments. And what that means is that they look like arguments, but they're not. <clears throat> they're deceptions. They're tricks. And these men were very clever in their tricks. 
They play tricks with words. They play tricks with ideas and arguments. And if you weren't really careful and you weren't well trained in the art of reasoning, you could get caught by their tricks. And in this last book, Aristotle explains how to catch them in their tricks. He teaches about apparent things that appear to be arguments but really aren't. Those six books make up Aristotle's Organon. This is where we learn the art of reasoning. This is where we learn classical, rational philosophy. Okay, these six books. And in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, these two books are taught in Classical Reasoning 1. This book is taught in Classical Reasoning 2, 3, 4, and 5. So in the Classical Reasoning, uh, in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we have five Classical Reasoning courses. <clears throat> and in these five Classical Reasoning courses, we study Aristotle's Organon. The reason we study these two books in the first course is simply because they're short. They're short little books that are studied pretty quickly. But, in Classical Reasoning 1, there's one more book that we study. It's a book titled, well, it's a book written by a man named Porphyry, written by a philosopher named Porphyry, and it's titled, The Introduction. <clears throat> so in Classical Reasoning 1, before we start Aristotle's Categories, we study a book titled, The Introduction by Porphyry. And we'll get started with that book in this lesson. So the study of classical reasoning is a study of Aristotle's Organon, the six books of the Organon, and as an introduction to Aristotle's reasoning, we study a book titled The Introduction by Porphyry. Porphyry lived in the time of the early Christians. <clears throat> okay, so when we talk about classical reasoning, this is what we mean, the study of these books. All right? So, did you get this in your notes? Pretty good, you're keeping up? Okay. So I'm going to erase all this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to erase all this. Okay, so in this, <clears throat> in this first lesson, we're going to get started with the first book. And as I said, that's Porphyry's introduction. Sometime, if you go to a library or look on the internet, you might see this book with its original Greek title. The Greek title of this book is the Isa Goge. And that is simply the Greek word for introduction. But sometimes you'll see the book listed with its Greek title. <clears throat> this book is an introduction. It's an introduction to Aristotle's categories. The first book of the Organon. We should ask, why do we need an introduction to Aristotle's categories? Why can't we just get started with Aristotle's categories? And there's, a, there's an important answer for that. Aristotle was like Jesus in a lot of different ways. Jesus taught, do not cast your pearls before swine. Right? Jesus taught that. What does that mean? It means... Do not give holy things to people who don't appreciate them. 
Okay? If I give a Bible to a person who doesn't respect religion, they throw it on the floor, they stand on it, they sit on it, they don't respect it. If you give a, a person who's not holy a rosary, they play with it, they break it. Jesus said, do not give holy things to unholy people. He said, do not cast your pearl before swine. That's why, for example, with the sacraments, the priests don't stand out by the side of the road and just give the Eucharist to anybody who walks past, right? In order to even receive the Eucharist, you've got to go through faith formation classes, sacramental preparation, you get interviewed, all this stuff to make sure you understand the sacrament and make sure you respect it. And then the pastor judges whether or not he thinks that you're prepared for it and you have, you know, respect for it. You have a right disposition, we say. Well, just like we protect and respect holy things in the church, Aristotle believed that wisdom was holy. He believed that it was sacred. And he knew, remember how I said the sophists were fakers who just wanted to pretend that they were wise. He knew that those people were always trying to get enough information so that they can look like wise men. And so what he did was, when he wrote his teachings, he chose to make them very difficult. He intentionally made his writings obscure. The word obscure Obscure means hidden, unclear. He intentionally made his writings obscure. They're very difficult to study, and he did that on purpose. <clears throat> he did that so that fakers and pretenders couldn't pretend to know his teaching. The only way that you can actually learn Aristotle's teaching is to become a true student of philosophy and to work for it, to sacrifice for it, to study for it. And if you don't study for it, you can't learn it. And he did that on purpose. So Aristotle's writings are obscure. At the same time, it's the role of a teacher to try and make difficult things easier for students. That's what a teacher does. He simply tries to make difficult lessons, difficult subjects, as easy for students to learn as possible, so students can enjoy the benefits of those lessons. And in the introduction, Porphyry wrote a book as a teacher for his student. He wrote a book to, in, to introduce him to Aristotle's categories so that he could easily make his way into Aristotle's categories and not have too much difficulty because Porphyry judged his student to be sincere and so he deserved help. Okay? And so this introduction was written by a wise man for one of his students to help him get started in Aristotle's categories, to take some of the obscurity, to take some of the difficulty of Aristotle's teachings away so he could study them. And again, that's what a teacher does, right? A teacher helps students who are willing to do the work. So the first book we study is Porphyry's Introduction so that we can have the help that Porphyry offered his student when he attempted to get started with Aristotle's categories. And so our first book in Classical Reasoning 1, the first book we study, is Porphyry's Introduction. And that's why. All right? <clears throat> Where are we at time-wise? 24. 24? Good. Okay, so what I'd like to do, I think that's a good enough introduction. There's a lot more that I could say, but I could fill hours talking about 
Aristotle's Organon, and we're going to talk about it as we study it. So I'll just save other information for other times when it comes up. What I'd like to do is spend the rest of this first lesson in uh, the first chapter of Porphyry's introduction. I'd like to go through the first chapter, and that'll wrap up lesson one. Okay, so let's take a look <clears throat> at the introduction of Porphyry, chapter one. <clears throat> you see right there in the first sentence the name Chrysa Aureus. Chrysa Aureus, you see that? That's the name of Porphyry's student. He's writing this book. It's a short book. He's writing this to this student named Chrysa Aureus. And he says at the opening of chapter 1, since it is necessary, Chrysa Aureus, both to the doctrine of the categories of Aristotle and to the formation of definitions, and in short, to those things which pertain to division and demonstration. And I, I want to stop there just to clarify this. He says, look, my student, there are a number of important things that you need to do in your studies. You need to study Aristotle's categories. You need to be able to form definitions, true definitions, which is very difficult. We talked about that the other day. Right? It's very difficult to define things. Philosophers have to work to find definitions for things. He says, since it's necessary for you, my student, to study the doctrine or the teaching of Aristotle's categories and to learn how to form definitions and for those things which pertain to division, that is, how to divide classes of things into their different species or different groups, And for demonstration, which is proof. Since you have to learn how to do all these things, since you have to study all of these things, the categories of Aristotle, how to make definitions, how to divide genera into species, and I know that you don't know what that means yet, but it's okay. To divide genera into species, and how to produce demonstration, to prove things, <clears throat> it's necessary for you to learn a couple of important concepts. Before you get started with those studies, <clears throat> it's important for you to learn a few concepts. And the whole purpose of this introduction, the whole purpose of this introduction is to explain to this student and to us the meaning of five different concepts. Five concepts. Okay? And here they are. The first concept is genus. The second is difference. The third is species. The fourth is peculiarity. And the fifth is accident. <clears throat> Porphyry says, in order for you to get started with Aristotle's categories, in order for you to learn how to form definitions, how to divide genera into species, how to produce demonstration, <clears throat> how to prove things, there are five ideas, five concepts that you have to understand before you begin those studies. And it's these five concepts. <clears throat> Genus, Difference, species, peculiarity, and accident. 
And so what's the goal of the study of Porphyry's introduction? The goal is for us to know what these five things are. And if you look at the document, you'll see that this is a short book. It's only 38 pages in this document, which is very short. And that's all that this book does, is explain to us what these five things are. <clears throat> because as a, as a wise teacher, Porphyry knows, because he is a great student first, that all good teachers are good students first. Porphyry knows that these are the concepts that men struggle with, that students struggle with when they try to read Aristotle. It's as if Aristotle knew that we have to understand these things first, and he chose not to explain them. And that's how he makes his writings obscure. And Porphyry is basically saying, if we learn these five concepts, the writings of Aristotle won't be so obscure won't be so difficult. I'm not going to tell you what these five things are because that's the whole purpose of this whole book. This whole first part of the course is to learn what these five things are. And we're going to study them in detail. All right? So the goal of studying Porphyry's introduction, write this down in your notes. The goal of studying Porphyry's introduction is to know what these five things are. And these have a name. They're called predicables. These are called the five predicables. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. The goal of the study of Porphyry's introduction is to learn the five predicables, what they are, how they're alike, how they're different, so that we can have this knowledge when we begin the study of Aristotle's writings on reasoning. What a predicable is, is, is very simple. Okay, I'm going to erase this information over here. What a predicable is, is very simple. You can easily understand what a predicable is. Anytime that we have a sentence, you know this from even elementary grammar, we have a subject, a verb, and a predicate. This is very simple, basic grammar. When we have a proposition, the kind of proposition we use in logic, the verb is called a copula. And you've learned about this in grammar. And all a copula does, all that a copula does is join a subject to a predicate. Now, if we take a subject, and we'll use Socrates as our subject. We'll talk about Socrates. And we'll say, Socrates is, this is our copula, is, Socrates is, and we can give a number of different predicates. We can say a number of different things about Socrates. But of all the different things that we could say, of all the different things we could say about Socrates, we can only say one of these five things. Whatever we say about Socrates is going to be a genus, a difference, a species, a peculiarity, or an accident. Okay? So what the five... You, know, you notice we have predica and predica, right? To predicate means, means to make a judgment to say something about a subject. That's what a judgment is. To connect ideas together. Socrates is, and we join it to another idea, to say something or to judge something to be true about Socrates. We can say Socrates is, and we can name a genus. We can say Socrates is 
an animal. Socrates is an animal. He's a living, he's a living creature. He's an animal. We can say Socrates is a man. We can say Socrates is a rational. You know what? Let me let me change the order just so this doesn't confuse you. We can say Socrates is rational. We can say that Socrates is a man. We can say that Socrates is um, able to laugh. I shouldn't say that. We can name a peculiarity about Socrates. A peculiarity would be something that's true only of him. Like if he was the only son of his father, we could say Socrates is the son of so-and-so. Okay, a peculiarity. And then lastly, <clears throat> so I'll just write son of... I think his father's name was Sophroniscus, but I'd have to check that. For some reason, I'm not sure. And then lastly, an accident. Socrates is sleeping. Now, we can say lots of different things, but there will only be five kinds of things. Five kinds of things that we can say about Socrates. These are the five predicables. Okay? Genus, difference, species, peculiarity, and accident. And what Porphyry explains is, this is what we have to understand in order to understand Aristotle's categories. Okay? Not this. This, this is just an example. So this is not important. Okay? This is not important. But what's important is that if we think about subjects and predicates, any subject and any predicate we can only say five kinds of things about any subject. Five predicables, able to be predicated. Five things that are able to be predicated about a subject. There are five different kinds of predicates. And I know you don't understand what this means, and it's okay, because this is what we're going to study in Porphyry's introduction. I'm just giving you an overview of what the purpose of this book is. And what Porphyry is saying to us is, if you don't understand this concept, if you don't understand these five different kinds of things that can be said about a subject, you're going to be confused trying to understand Aristotle's categories. And that's why it's so difficult. And if we study to understand these five predicables, we'll take away that difficulty, and studying Aristotle's categories won't be so hard. Okay? Let's get back to the text here. <clears throat> Since you're going to study the categories, the formation of definitions, and things which pertain to division and demonstration, it's necessary for you to know what these things are. And he lists them there. I didn't make them up. He lists them there. He says, it's necessary for you to know what genus, difference, species, peculiarity, and accident are. Do you see that? It's necessary for you to know what these five things are. And he goes on to say, all the rest on that page is notes, so you can ignore that. He says, and since also the theory of these, the knowledge of these, is useful in a summary way, I will briefly endeavor to discuss for you, in the form as it were of an introduction, what has been delivered or taught on this subject by the ancients, 
So what I'd like to do for you, Chrysiorius, my student, what I'd like to do for you, because it's necessary for you to understand these five things, genus, difference, species, peculiarity, and accident. Since it's necessary for you to know these things, what I would like to do is summarize for you what the ancient philosophers taught about these five things. Because if you understand that, then you'll be able to understand Aristotle's categories and you'll have help understanding all of these other subjects in reasoning. I'm going to explain to you, discuss for you, in the form of an introduction, what has been delivered or given to us on this subject by the ancients. Now he goes on to say, but I'm going to abstain from more profound investigations. In other words, these discussions about these five things, this can get really deep. And, and I'm not going to go into all the deep stuff. This is just going to be an introduction, just intended to provide you with what you need to understand at this point in your studies. I'm not going to go into some deep study of these five things because they're very complicated. But I'm going to summarize for you in the form of an introduction what the ancients have taught about these five things. I'm going to abstain or keep out of profound discussions of these things, but appropriately directing my attention to such as are more simple. I'm going to focus on the simple things. We're just going to have an introduction. My meaning is this, he says, I am going to omit to speak about genera and species, whether they have a subsistence in the nature of things or have an existence alone in the mere conceptions of the soul. And I know that you have no idea what that means, but it's okay. He says, this is where this gets really deep. When we talk about things like animal and man and, and these different divisions and categories and classes of things, it's very confusing to think about whether they really exist or if they're just ideas and words that men use. That's a really complicated discussion and we're not going to get into that stuff. We're not going to talk about whether these ideas actually exist or whether man just created these ideas and gave them names. We're not going to talk about that because it's very complicated. That's not the point. I'm going to omit that discussion. Whether they, uh, if they have subsistence in the nature of things, whether they are bodies or whether they are incorporeal, whether they are separate from sensible things or insensible things, and about these have their substance, he's saying, all of that stuff, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to get into those deep philosophical discussions. That's not the purpose. On the top of page 17 in the document, we're already near the end of chapter 1. Look at the top of page 17 of the document. He says, a discussion of this kind about these things is most profound, is very, very complicated, very difficult, and requires another greater investigation first. So you're not capable, you're not ready to have this discussion. And therefore, I'm not going to talk about these things because you're not ready for it. The greater investigation is the study of metaphysics, which is a whole different philosophical science. He says you have to study metaphysics first, and when you study metaphysics, then you'll be able to talk about these subjects. So you're not ready for that, and I'm not going to talk about that. And this last sentence is very important. He says... In what manner, however, the ancients, and especially the peripatetics, I'll write this word up on the board, 
he says, what I'm going to explain to you is what the ancients, and in particular, the peripatetics, this is a funny word, it just means the followers of Aristotle. He's going to only talk about what Aristotle's followers have taught about these things because they know Aristotle's teaching. So the peripatetics are the followers of Aristotle. And just so you know the meaning of this fancy name, the word peripateo in Greek means to walk around. The peripatetics, it was a name for Aristotle's followers because apparently they liked to walk around as they taught and discuss things. They were the peripatetics, all right? That's one tradition about the meaning of this name, the origin of this name. The peripatetics, it's just another name for the followers of Aristotle. So what Porphyry tells us, and this is very important, I'm going to share with you, in an introduction, what Aristotle's followers have said about genus and species, difference, peculiarity, and accident, because they understand Aristotle's teaching on those subjects. So I'm going to explain to you, teach to you, what the ancients, the ancient philosophers, especially the peripatetics, have discussed and the other objects of inquiry in a more logical manner, I will endeavor to show you. And that's the end of chapter 1. So in chapter 1, this is what's important, in chapter 1 of the introduction, Porphyry explains what he plans to do in this book titled The Introduction. He's writing it to his student to share with him a summary of what Aristotle's followers have taught about these five important ideas so that his student can have an easier time reading and understanding Aristotle's teaching. It's very simple. You understand that? Hmm? I'm not asking if you understand every detail of this. I'm asking if you understand the idea of what Porphyry is doing. He's simply providing a book to help his student study Aristotle more easily. And Porphyry's book became famous after he wrote it and has for many hundreds of years by classical philosophers and, and schools. They don't exist anymore, but... They always included the study of Porphyry as a preparation for Aristotle's categories, Aristotle's organon. All right? That's the, the content of chapter one or lesson one in Classical Reasoning One. So we're through lesson one of Classical Reasoning One, and we covered quite a bit of material in this lesson, and I moved quickly. So let me just give a quick overview of what we did. We talked about how classical reasoning is not in the modern high school curriculum. So if you ask me, is classical reasoning necessary for my high school diploma? The answer is no. The high school diploma doesn't even include classical reasoning. Is it necessary for college admission? No. Colleges don't even look for studies in classical reasoning. As, as crazy as that might sound, modern schools do not teach the art of reasoning. Very strange. Not a part of the high school curriculum, not necessary for a high school diploma, not necessary for college admission. Why should I study classical reasoning if it's not required for high school? I don't need it for my diploma, and I don't need it to go to college. Why should I study classical reasoning? Classical reasoning is the most important subject in a philosophical curriculum. 
So if you want to pursue wisdom, you have to know the art of reasoning. If you don't want to pursue wisdom, then you don't need to study classical reasoning. And that's why our society doesn't study classical reasoning. They don't want to pursue wisdom. But if you want to be different and you do want to pursue wisdom, then you're going to need to know, and I should have said this before, <clears throat> you're going to need to know Aristotle's organon because this word organon has an important meaning. It means the instrument. It's the, the instrument. It's the tool. Instrument here, it doesn't mean like a trumpet, not a, not a musical instrument. It means an instrument like a tool that you use. The organon, the art of reasoning, is the instrument that you need to pursue wisdom. It's the instrument by which we pursue wisdom. So if you want to pursue wisdom, and I hope that you do, even though it's not popular to do so, I hope that you choose to do what others don't do, because it's, it's good and wise. If you choose to pursue wisdom in your life, you need to have the tool. And the tool is the art of reasoning. And you learn it from Aristotle's organon, which is the instrument of philosophy. <clears throat> okay, we said that Aristotle wrote a series of books, which all together are called the tool, the instrument, the organon. And it started with the categories on interpretation, two books on analytics, um, topics, and sophistical refutations. I quickly said what each book is about, and then I said the important thing I wanted you to know is what a sophist is, because the sophists were Aristotle's enemies, and sophists are all of our enemies. They come in many different forms. People who appear, who just want to appear to be wise for the sake of making money. The last book of the Organon was Sophistical Refutations, how to destroy sophistical arguments. And then we said that even though that's the Organon, those are the books of the Organon, there's one other book, a book that um, Porphyry wrote called The Introduction. We talked about how Aristotle's writings are difficult to understand, and he did that on purpose. Porphyry wrote a book to help one of his students get started. It's called The Introduction, and that's the first book we're studying in Classical Reasoning 1. We said that Porphyry's introduction, and we read this in chapter 1, seeks to explain what Aristotle's followers in the ancient times, what they taught about five different topics. Genus, difference, species, peculiarity, and accident. And Aristotle's followers are called peripatetics. And the goal of studying Porphyry's introduction is to understand the five predicables so that we can more easily study Aristotle's writings on the art of reasoning. Okay? That is all for lesson one.